The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. A New Year's greeting from the pastor of Baraka Church. The expression, Happy New Year, has become inadequate and superficial. It is ridiculous to wish someone a Happy New Year when they cannot be happy, apart from the divine plan and God's gracious provision for the individual. Happiness comes through an eternal relationship with God. This relationship is only possible through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. For when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross during the last three hours of His crucifixion, all of the sins of the world were poured out upon Him and judged. He who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He bore our sins in His own body on the tree. And therefore Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And again, him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. So neither is there salvation in any other. There is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now a happy new year is for the person who has received Jesus Christ as his Savior. For not only does he possess eternal life, but at the same time, he has the divine operating assets available, whereby he can have inner peace, inner happiness, inner power, inner blessing throughout all of the difficulties of life as well as the pleasant days of life. So instead of wishing you a happy new year today, I'm going to wish you as a believer a box, a bottle, a book, and a bag. The box is found in Exodus chapter 25, verse 38, where we read, and the tongs thereof, and the snuff dishes, literally the snuff boxes thereof, shall be of pure gold. In the midst of the description of the golden lampstand or the candlestick of the tabernacle, a forgotten snuff box is mentioned. This box was used to collect the burnt wick from the lamp. The lamp, of course, is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. The basic structure and composition is gold. The gold represents the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The almonds on the branches speak of the resurrection of the humanity of Christ. The light is the testimony regarding the Son of God, as well as the presentation of the gospel. The wick is the believer who is the instrument in witnessing or personal evangelism. The oil represents God the Holy Spirit who indwells every believer. Every believer is in full-time Christian service. Every believer is an ambassador for Christ. As a part of this ambassadorship, witnessing is the responsibility of every believer. Therefore, a part of Christian service, and a very important part, is the principle of witnessing for the Son of God. The burnt wick is past service for the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore the priest would come in periodically and take a pair of tongs and clip off the wick placing it in the golden snuff box or the wick box. So we have then the concept which is presented to us through the box. The box actually preserves all of the past service of the believer. Since every believer is in full-time Christian service, every act of service, great or small, is clipped by our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, and preserved in the golden box of his memory. The box preserves the memory of all past service. And as you review your past year, you might ask yourself this question, How much burnt wick has God placed in the box for me? Everything that you have done which can be called divine good, every time that you have been filled with the Spirit, whether you gave a cup of cold water in the Lord's name, whether you offered prayer, whether you were in worship, whether you were witnessing, regardless of what you were doing, when you do it in the power of the Spirit, it counts. It becomes gold, silver, and precious stones rather than wood, hay, and stubble. Wood, hay, and stubble actually represents human good. And there is no place in the plan of God for human good. First of all, at the cross. Therefore, the Scripture says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Now, human good actually comes from the area of strength of the old sin nature. And that's why human good is described in Isaiah 64, 6 as our righteousness being filthy rags. Romans 8.8 8 tells us, They that are in the flesh cannot please God. Nowhere in the plan of God is there any place for man's energy of the flesh and man's activity. Such activity is called dead works in Hebrews 6.1. And so when we come to the cross, we must accept the work of God the Son. He is our Savior. He died for us. He took our place. He became our substitute. Therefore, we cannot be saved by anything we can do. Sincerity, 
changing our wicked ways, living up to the golden rule or the Ten Commandments, joining a church, being baptized, or some other human activity. There is no place in the plan of God for human activity or human good. There is only a place for divine good. And therefore, in salvation, where the plan of God begins, we have this phrase, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Once we accept Jesus Christ as Savior, we enter into a second phase of God's plan, the believer in time. In time, every believer is in full-time service. Every believer is an ambassador for Christ. Every believer is a priest. Every believer is indwelt by the Spirit, indwelt by Christ, and entered into union with Christ. And therefore, production is required as a part of God's plan for the believer in time. And this production falls into one of two categories. Divine good is produced by the filling of the Spirit, plus a knowledge of doctrine. Human good is produced when the believer is out of fellowship and performs some good deed. A believer can sin, be out of fellowship, and witness, and it doesn't count. He can sin, be out of fellowship, and pray, and it doesn't count. For if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. We must be in fellowship. We must be filled with the Spirit before it can count. And that's why the Scripture says, Not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. So all past service is a burnt wick. If the wick is not trimmed, the supply of oil will not pass through the wick and burn. When the Lord Jesus Christ, as our high priest, trims the lamp of your life, he places all of the past service in the golden box of his memory until the judgment seat of Christ, where divine good is rewarded and human good is destroyed. Now, don't try to take the burnt wick out of the box. Don't let past service be a hindrance to future service. Don't rest on your laurels. In some cases, past service definitely becomes a hindrance to any future production. And therefore today, instead of wishing you a happy new year, I'm going to wish you a full box of burnt wick for the coming year. The bottle is found in Psalm 56.8, where we read, Thou tellest, or literally, Thou dost record my wanderings. Put thou my tears in thy bottle. The corrected translation from the Hebrew sounds like this. My fugitive life thou hast told. My tears are laid up in thy bottle. Now the background of Psalm 56, it is written by David when he was fleeing from Saul. It was written during a period of catastrophe, disaster, and great pressure in his life. The word wanderings, which is mentioned here, refers to the fugitive life of David when Saul sought his life. For David it was a time of many tears, a time of great sorrow, a time of pressure. The tears of David were preserved by God in a bottle. It was the custom of the ancient world for mourners to put their tears in a bottle and place them on the top of a tomb of a loved one. How beautiful to think of the Lord putting our tears in the bottle. How encouraging to remember that He is mindful of all of our tears. Tears speak of our sufferings, our sorrows, our pressures, our frustrations, our disasters. And in such a case, only Bible doctrine is a source of comfort. When it deals with death, we have Bible doctrine to console us. For when a person dies, he is absent from the body and face to face with the Lord. There is no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more death. The old things have all passed away. We lose valuable things, but we know that the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Oh, we have pressures and disasters and heartaches, but we are told by the Word of God, Psalm 55:22. Cast thy burdens upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Or 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your cares on him. God has provided for every disaster, every heartache, every difficulty in this life. Think of it. You will never have a problem. You will never have a pressure. You will never have a disaster or a heartache which is too great for the plan of God. No matter what you have suffered, God knows all about it. The tears are in the bottle of God's comfort and God's provision, the bottle of Bible doctrine which meets every need of the life. And everyone, of course, can expect tears in the coming year. But God has provided for your suffering, your disaster, your catastrophe, your heartache, your frustration. Bible doctrine is God's comfort in time of sorrow. 
And therefore, instead of wishing you a happy new year, I wish you as a believer in Jesus Christ for the coming year a bottle full of tears of God's comfort in time of sorrow. Bible doctrine, meeting the needs of your life. The book is found in Malachi 3.16. Then they that feared or reverenced the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord was listening to them and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that reverenced the Lord and thought upon his name. It was the custom of Persian kings to write the names of deserving people in a book where the deeds of the deserving could be remembered for the purpose of reward at a future time. This custom is illustrated by the message given in Esther 6.1. Now here we have God's book of remembrance. And three things are found in this book. First of all, the fear or the reverence of the Lord, which is in reality the highest of all techniques for the Christian life, occupation with Christ. Here is the perspective of the Christian life. Occupation with Christ is found in such passages as Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Or Colossians 3, 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, and not on things on the earth. And so we have the principle of occupation with Christ. And after all, occupation with Christ is nothing more or less than the simple principle of carrying the faith rest technique to its logical conclusion. If you as a believer are claiming the promises of God daily in your life, then ultimately, as a result of claiming God's promises, you are going to have the most fantastic blessings. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. In other words, God has provided for you in a marvelous, glorious, wonderful way. He has provided promises for every difficulty, every need, every problem that you could face. Take the problem of sin. He has provided 1 John 1, 9, which says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Take the problems of the uncertainties of life which could cause fear. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. The second thing found in the book of remembrance is the phrase, speaking often one to another. That is, encouraging other believers with Bible doctrine and with the divine viewpoint of life. The third factor is thinking or meditating on his name which has to do with the perception or the absorption of Bible doctrine. So the Lord preserves the memory of three things. First of all, the utilization of the faith rest technique, which is perpetuated and parlayed into the point of occupation with Christ. Secondly, fellowship with other believers on the basis of the presentation of God's Word. Thirdly, learning and applying Bible doctrine to experience. Now, these things result in a full book of divine memories. Therefore, instead of wishing you a happy new year for the coming year, I wish you a full book for the coming year, a book filled with the victories of the faith rest technique, a book filled with occupation with Christ, a book full of wonderful Christian fellowship, a book full of knowledge of doctrine and its application to the human soul. The bag is found in John chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put in it. That phrase, had the bag, is the point on which we want to concentrate. The bag, of course, speaks of money. There is a sense in which each believer is holding the bag. There is a sense in which God has entrusted to us materialistic things. And because He has, this means that, along with everything else, we have responsibility with regard to the money which we possess. Therefore, first of all, it is important that we have the proper perspective with regard to money.
Money is a legitimate function of life. In fact, money is a tremendous time saver. If we had to trade one thing for another, we had to carry around a 100-pound sack of potatoes and trade it for some tomatoes and other things, it would take a long time just to get enough food, It'd take 24 hours perhaps to get a meal. But because we have money, we have a medium of exchange. And as a medium of exchange, money is proper, correct, useful, and wonderful. It isn't money that's the root of all evil. The Scripture says the love of money is the root of all evil, and this is something entirely different. So let's examine some of the illusions with regard to money. People often think that money means happiness. Of course, this is false because happiness comes through being oriented to God's plan, being under God's grace. And this means we have to start at the cross. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. These are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Another illusion about money is the fact that it means security. This, too, is false because the only real security we can have for time or for eternity comes through Jesus Christ. The concept, the illusion that money can buy anything is also false. Now, this means, of course, that people often focus their attention on money as a detail of life. And money often represents just exactly that, the details of life. Now, the details of life are legitimate in themselves. Money, success, happiness, pleasure, friends, loved ones, health, materialistic things. These are legitimate things. And yet the Scripture tells us in Matthew 4.4, 4, quoting Deuteronomy 8.3, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What does this mean? Well, it means that the details of life have a place and function and mechanics of life but that these details are not the important thing. The important thing in life is occupation with Christ. The important thing in life is Bible doctrine. When we have Bible doctrine, we have inner happiness, we have inner peace, inner power, inner blessing. We have all of those things that really count. And so if doctrine is first, when we have the details of life, we can enjoy them. When we lose the details of life, it makes no difference. We still have doctrine. We still have the Lord and nothing is really changed. You see, this is the story of the widow's might. The widow was a believer in Jesus Christ. She had Bible doctrine up in her mentality of the soul. And when she went in, she had very little money, two pence. And so she gave all the money she had. She put it in the treasury. When she left, she had left behind her two pence. All of her money was gone. But what did she have? She had Bible doctrine. She had the Lord. She had the source of everything in life. And so she was in very fine condition. Many people worship money as a god. Of course, money is a useful and helpful servant, but it becomes a very cruel and harsh master. This is taught in Matthew 6.24. Money has many legitimate functions in exchange, in business, and so on. There are many dangers, of course, in connection with money. As far as the unbeliever is concerned, there's a tendency for him to trust in money rather than to trust in Jesus Christ. And yet we have to remember that salvation has been paid for. For 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, We are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without spot and without blemish. And so Mark 8, 36 and 37 says, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? There is nothing that a man can give in exchange for his soul. But this passage is not talking about money as it relates to the unbeliever. Since Jesus Christ died on the cross for the unbeliever, the only issue that he must face is, What think ye of Christ? And the issue, John 3.36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. This passage, however, does deal with the principle of the believer and his money, since the money represents the details of life. Luke 6.38 says to the believer, Give, and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. For with the same measure that you measure it out, it shall be measured to you again. The principle is also found over in Proverbs 11, 24, and 25, which says literally from the Hebrew, There is the one who gives generously, and yet he increases. There is the one who is stingy, and it tends toward poverty. The giving or the gracious soul shall be made prosperous, 
and he that watereth, it shall be watered to him again. So we have the principle given throughout the word of God that there is a concept in giving. God will remain, of course, in no man's debt, and we have responsibility not only spiritually, but in the material things of life as well. I think the concept of giving has been well expressed by a poem which goes like this. A big silver dollar and a little brown cent rolling along together went, rolling along the smooth sidewalk. When the dollar said, four dollars can talk, you poor little cent, you cheap little mite, I'm bigger and more than twice as bright. I'm worth more than you and hundredfold. And written on me in letters bold is a motto drawn from a pious creed. In God we trust, which all may read. Yes, yes, I know, said the cent. I'm a cheap little mite. And I know I'm not big, nor good, nor bright. And yet said the cent, with a meek little sigh. You don't go to church as often as I. Well, here we have the box, the bottle, the book, and the bag. We have those things which really form a wonderful New Year greeting for one who is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, You'll never have a happy new year, this year, next year, or next, or next, unless you come into a personal relationship with the Son of God. And this is very easy, for the Scripture says, But as many as received Him, to them gave He the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. You can have eternal life. You can become a child of God. You can become a child of God right now by simply putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Wherever you sit, listening to my voice, think of it. Heaven is yours. Eternal life is yours. Relationship with God forever. Entrance into His plan. This is yours right now by simply trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, by simply believing in Him. In a moment of time, you can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that moment of time, you will become the possessor of eternal life. So, in thinking of the great world of those who have not accepted Christ... May I say that a New Year's greeting would be trite and useless. The only greeting I could have for you is one which is most important. Consider the claims of Christ on your life. Look at the one who died on the cross and took your place. Look at the one who was judged for you. The full wrath of God the Father was poured out upon Him when your sins were in His body on the cross. Think of it. Jesus Christ had you personally in mind. He was thinking about you. And if you had been the only sinner in the history of the human race, He would have gone to that cross just for you. And that's really what He did. He went to the cross just for your sins, just to remove the barrier between you and God, just to make it possible for you to have eternal life. I couldn't possibly wish you a happy new year, because if you die without accepting Christ, there's nothing left but the lake of fire an eternal separation from God. And this is a tragedy which is so monstrous and so horrible that it can't even be contemplated. And so I'm not going to wish the unbeliever a happy new year. I'm going to wish for every person listening to me who has not accepted Christ, I'm going to wish for you a year of decision, a time to accept Christ as your Savior. Now, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ... This message has something for you, something very pertinent and something very wonderful. The box preserves the memory of Christian service. The bottle preserves the memory of comfort in time of disaster and adversity. The book preserves the memory of occupation with Christ, worship and fellowship with other believers. The bag preserves the memory of Christian giving. Therefore, instead of wishing you a happy new year... I wish for every born-again believer for the coming year a full box, a full bottle, a full book, and an empty bag.